fallacy that we're looking at in this video, the argument from ignorance, is one that's been around for a very long time. You're going to see it in most uh, critical thinking textbooks. You'll see it talked about in a lot of other um, similar sources where they're talking about bad argumentation. What we're going to do in this video is eight things. We're going to talk first about what the argument from ignorance actually is. Then we will examine the argument structure. We'll talk about why it's a fallacy, what's wrong with this kind of argumentation. Then we'll move on and look at some common situations in which you can expect it to arise where you ought to be on your guard. We'll look at three examples of the fallacy. If you want to see further examples, we'll be uploading other videos down the line full of uh, all sorts of examples for you. And then we'll talk about how you can spot it, what you should be on guard for. For the students that are out there, we'll talk about what other fallacies it tends to get mixed up with and why. And then we'll talk about how you can avoid falling into this fallacy or fixing it when, when you do fall into it in your own reasoning and argumentation so you can improve your own critical thinking skills. So what is this argument? What is this argument from ignorance? It's got a couple different names. Um, one of them is a Latin name, argumentum ad ignorantium. That just means argument from ignorance. Um, it's also called the appeal to ignorance. And you'll see it sometimes called the burden of proof or shifting the burden of proof. Lately, I've been starting to see it uh, in, in theist, anti-theist polemics as the god of the gaps argument. But that's a little bit more of a, a rarefied use. Now, what is it? It asserts that a claim can be definitively said to be true because it has not been definitively proven to be false. That's what an argument from ignorance is. Or it could go the other way around. You say something is definitely false because you haven't proven that it's true. Um, another variation on this has to do with existence. You say that something exists even though we haven't encountered it because it has not been proven not to exist, or you can do the vice versa for that as well. So the structure of this fallacy is that somebody says claim X has not been proven to be false, and they go to the conclusion that X is therefore true. Now, what are they assuming along the way? That's where these implicit premises come in, these, these bracketed ones. So one of these has to do with the nature of burden of proof. Burden of proof is a concept that we probably need to do a whole other video on to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to assume that you're familiar with it here. The burden of proof falls on the side of those who assert that X is false. That, that could be true or that, that could be false, right? The, the whole sentence there. Um, but that's one of the things that the person who's making this argument is assuming. They might also be assuming if X has not been proven false, then it is true. And it's those sorts of implicit premises that get you from saying that something hasn't been proven to be false to therefore it's true. Or from saying something hasn't been proven to be true, therefore it's false. You have to make those kinds of assumptions to make this, this argument work. You can look at the structure of this fallacy and see that it's kind of similar to, to a few other arguments as well. What's going on is that the burden of proof is being shifted from the side that claims that X is true to the side that claims that X is false, saying that they have to demonstrate it. And I've got these bars here because, you know, there would be some sort of sufficient or convincing evidence that X is false. And you say, that doesn't count. Uh, therefore, uh, you can reject the claim that X is false. And since you're rejecting that claim, you know that X is true. There's, there's the, the fallacy in a nutshell. What's wrong with this? Well, in this fallacy, you're displacing the burden of proof from where it ought to rest to the other side. And the question of where the burden of proof ought to rest, like I put here, that's a larger topic. We're going to have to do a separate video on that. But, I mean, here's, here's a few rules of thumb for that. Um, if you're going to make an outrageous claim that goes against common experience, the burden of proof is really on you. So if you want to claim that unicorns exist, uh, let alone that you know you, you hit one with your car last week, um, that's where the damage came from, the burden of proof is on you. You don't get to say, well, you haven't proven unicorns don't exist, so therefore you know I get to assume that they do. There's a lot of things like this. There's, there's a lot of... Um, 
topics on which it's not so easy to, to say. Unicorns are an easy one, but you know we'll talk about that a little bit later. This kind of fallacy can also be regarded as incorporating another fallacy called false dilemma, which we're going to have a whole video about down the line. Why? It confines the possibilities to either something is known to be true or it's known to be false, and it ignores the possibility that something might not be known to be true or false or that it might actually be unknowable. It could be unknowable per se. It could be unknowable from our vantage point. Um, you know, one of the, the things, a lot of people don't like Donald Rumsfeld because of the Gulf War, but he had one really uh, brilliant thing that he said. He talked about the fact that there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and then there are unknown unknowns. And the fact that there are known unknowns means that there are some things where we say, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know how long this, this jacket is going to last me. Um, that's something that I'll have to wait to find out. Unknown unknowns are the things that we're not even aware of, the, you know, not knowing. Um, or that we, we don't have any sort of decision procedure that could, like, you know, bring them in. Another thing that comes up, there's a catchphrase that's kind of useful if you want to trot it out at, at parties or, you know, when somebody else makes this fallacy. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Now, make sure that you get it right in your head so you don't say evidence of absence is not absence of evidence because that's, that's not quite the same thing. When you're playing with these what we call chiastic, you know, where there's an X uh, sort of structure to it, you got to be careful with them, right? Because sometimes you end up saying a lot of crazy stuff. But in this one, in this case, absence of evidence, not, you know, not having evidence for something being the case is not evidence of absence. So the lack of evidence for, you know, this, this, this coffee cup, um, I know what's in it. It's coffee and, and milk, but maybe you think it's vodka, right? Um, now, not having evidence that it, that it isn't vodka is not uh, evidence that it is vodka. Th this is getting a little bit more complicated than it should be. Let's say, you know, you, you want to say, couldn't possibly be vodka. You're not looking at this. You don't know what's, what's in here. Absence of evidence. You don't have any evidence about what's in here other than, you know, mm, good coffee. My say-so, right? Um, that's not evidence for you that it doesn't have any vodka in it. I mean, I'm telling you it doesn't, but because I don't, you know, drink during the day when I'm shooting videos. Uh, but, you know, you don't know, do you? Let's look at some common situations. So when does this come up? It's often used about matters about which there's some controversy. And we can have controversy in two important ways. We can have controversy about whether something is the case or isn't the case, whether something exists or doesn't exist, whether something's possible or impossible. And then we can also have controversy about whose job it is to prove what's the case. There are situations where the two sides are so at odds with each other that they don't even agree about where the burden of proof would lie. So that's, that's a common situation where you're going to see this kind of appeal being made. It also occurs in situations in which a person or a group or an institution or a class gets placed under suspicion, and then they're expected to prove themselves above suspicion, not bad, you know, right, um, not having violated something. So, you know, that's shifting the burden of proof onto them. You know, we have this um, in our country and <clears throat> generally in, in, in um, British common law, which, which our, our legal system is, is uh, descended from, there's this principle of uh, innocent until proven guilty. That's not the case in, in uh, some other legal systems. Um, totalitarian countries... Burden of proof is generally on you to prove that you did not do whatever it is the authorities are saying that you, you did. There's a shifting of the burden of proof. So what are common contexts? Um, political and policy discussions, you'll see it ma being made there. 
a lot of this going on in theist atheist debates and apologetics um, the, usually it's the the atheist saying you know you're just you're just making appeals to ignorance and saying that God did this and God did that I often see arguments from ignorance being made on, on the side of atheists as well um, I actually this is a side note I try to stay out of these theist atheist debates because usually a lot of it's a, full of fallacies and at a pretty low level of argumentation personal and professional relationships um, it's very tempting to assume that something is the case because it hasn't been proven not to be the case and then find out that you're wrong about that um, you know is your boss taking credit for your accomplishments oh you don't know that they're they're doing that for certain um, they still could be you know Paranormal matters. This gets used a lot in talking about ghosts or ESP or aliens, things like that. That leads us to conspiracy theories closely related to that. Um, a lot of conspiracy theories actually include a whole bunch, like a whole chain of arguments from ignorance because X hasn't been proven to be the case. We know that Y is the case. Um, advertisers' claims about products and manufacturers when products go bad. When people say this this product is dangerous, they'll often say, "Well, you haven't demonstrated a clear link between it." Uh, one classic example of that: the the uh, cigarette industry's long-standing uh, attempt to try to say that nobody had demonstrated a link between uh, cigarettes and cancer, and because they hadn't, that therefore we knew that cigarettes were safe. Um, let's look at some examples now. Those those were some examples. Let's look at some others. So, existence of alien life. I'll bet there are aliens out there keeping tabs on us right now. After all, we've only examined a tiny portion of the galaxy. We certainly haven't proved that they're not out there. Therefore, I know aliens exist. That's a bad argument, right? I mean, there could be reasons why we should think that there's aliens. You could try to strengthen this by saying stuff about, you know, the likelihood of life. You could make these mathematical arguments. But they're not doing that here. They're just saying... Look, you know, we've, we, we've only looked at a little bit of it. We, we haven't proved that they're not out there. Therefore, they are out there. That therefore is the problem here. It's not just saying that they could be out there. It's saying they are out there. That's why we have an argument from ignorance here. Number two, weapons of mass destruction. This is an interesting one, um, in part because, as it turned out, you know, this was used by, by a lot of... <clears throat> a lot of people and turns out that there actually were some and and we were finding them in other places um, there's a whole complicated can of worms with this someday I'm actually gonna I always wanted to do a book on the Gulf War and the justifications for it that's a side note so here's how this kind of argument Bush lied Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath regime never had any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq if they had any they'd have, they'd have been found and we'd have seen the reports of them we've never seen any we've never had any such reports therefore there never were any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq at least after Gulf War one where were there, we knew there were right um, well so there, there's a couple things here one is you know, to say that we didn't <clears throat> we didn't see any reports, there's the problem of whether things are actually reported by the media. Um, we just saw recently that, that one of uh, uh, Obama's speeches on immigration didn't get covered by major networks. Um, that's, that's kind of a problem. Um, it could be that, you know, some stuff is being reported but not being uh, reported to the right people or it's not getting to the national media. That's one issue, right? But let's say that we have, like, perfect reporting. So if the people who are supposed to be looking for weapons uh, find anything, it will automatically be everywhere on the, the, the media. Iraq's a big country. And to say that we haven't found them yet doesn't mean we'll never find them. It means we have a good chance of not finding them. The more uh, space that we actually look in, especially if we're looking in the places where we'd expect to find them, we can say, well, there's a 99% probability. Um, in this case, we've actually found that some of them were, in fact, moved to Syria. You know, big surprise. Bath regime in Syria, bath regime in Iraq. Um, but this is an interesting example. Let's look at the third example. 
Uh, here we're dealing with suspicion, right? A suspicious spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, these are the sorts of things that get people into lots and lots of trouble. Where did you go after work? You say you stopped at the bar for drinks with your work colleagues. How do I know that's where you went? Do you have a bar receipt? Did you pocket a coaster, a matchbook, anything you can show me? And then the conclusion, I know you're cheating on me. Well, how do you get from that to I know you're cheating on me? Unless you can demonstrate that you were actually at the bar, you can come up with something like a receipt or a coaster or a matchbook, something from that bar, maybe a, you know, a selfie where I can see the bar behind me. Unless you can show me that, unless you give me proof, I'm going to assume that you were cheating on me. Well, that's an argument from ignorance, right? How do you spot this? Be aware of where the burden of proof should actually rest when it comes to controversial claims. Watch out for people shifting the burden of proof unreasonably. There could be times when we ought to shift the burden of proof. Certain evidence may say, ah, this person is no longer trustworthy. Now it's on them to prove their case. Um, but a lot of times people are, are being rather preemptive with that. In complex and controversial matters, and those often overlap, be attentive for claims that either something is proven to be the case or it's therefore proven not to be the case or vice versa. This all or nothing kind of reasoning. Be really attentive to that because if it's a complicated issue, odds are those aren't the only possibilities. Now also, try to determine what could count as good reasons for definitively accepting or denying a claim or having some grounds for provisionally accepting or denying it. That's, if you walk into situations armed with that, then you'll say, ah, yeah, that, that person over there is not providing good reasons. They're, they're engaging in a fallacy. For you students out there, um, there's a couple different fallacies this can get mixed up with, and I don't want you to confuse these with, with those other fallacies. So, if you look at the structure, the diagram of this, this looks a lot like straw man. What's the difference between an argument from ignorance and straw man? When you're just attacking another person's argument to make your argument look better, then it's a straw man fallacy. <clears throat> now you could be doing that by actually making an argument from ignorance. They, these can be wrapped into each other. But usually when you're just attacking another person's argument saying, look, they don't have any good grounds for what they're saying because you're distorting what they're saying, that's a straw man. With the argument from ignorance, you're going a little bit further than that. You're saying, because this person hasn't made their case, I can make my case. So there's a similarity there, but they're, they are different. Arguments that, that don't focus on the burden of proof, but whether the person who's making the argument finds the claim plausible or intelligible, are actually a closely related argument called the argument from incredulity. And I've got another video on that. that you, you want to take a look at that one to see what the difference is there. Um, the third thing is that sometimes what we're really dealing with is wishful thinking. And with wishful thinking, somebody might shift the burden of proof because they really, really, really like the thing that they say is true to be true or what they're saying to be false. You know, for example, somebody comes to you and says, you know, your spouse is cheating on you. He's, I, you've got to be kidding. I've been married 15 years. Uh, you know, I'm in love. Uh, they're in love with me. And they say, well, um... Here's the photos. You say, well, Photoshop, you know, you can doctor these sort of things up. I don't know, that really looks like, like their face. Eh, I'm not going to accept that. You know, you got to, do you have anything, do you have any DNA evidence for me? <laughs> do, you have any, do, you have, do you have, you know, a video for me that, you know, couldn't possibly have been doctored? Um, that looks like an argument from ignorance. But it, it's really wishful thinking. It's, it's trying to keep that. And, uh, you know, this is one of those ones where the line is, is a little bit blurry, admittedly. 
Um, hopefully you won't run into that sort of question. Now, not every argument that focuses on where the burden of proof lies is actually a fallacious argument. So you don't want to get fallacy diagnosis happy once you've learned this fallacy and say, ah, you've mentioned the burden of proof, therefore you are committing the argument from ignorance. That's not the case. What has to be going on is the burden of proof has to be unreasonably displaced to the other person, and you got to be saying that because they haven't made their case, we can definitively say this is the case. How do you avoid falling into this? So again, you really want to be aware of where the burden of proof ought to lie when it comes to controversial matters, especially when your own emotions or your interests are at play. We have a tendency to blind ourselves to you know, where the burden of proof ought to go on, on those sort of bases. Another thing to do, if you find yourself falling into it. Ask yourself whether the claims that you're tempted to support by shifting the burden of proof, could you support them in any other way? Could you make a better argument um, with grounds that other reasonable people could accept? If you can, just don't make the argument from ignorance. Make another appeal. And then keep in mind, and this is a very important point, there's a lot of things that we, we don't have perfect knowledge about. We, we can't get completely incontrovertible proof, and that doesn't mean that we can't reasonably say that um, you know this is the case or that's the case. It also um, doesn't mean that that they're therefore totally unknown, that they're a black box and we can't penetrate them in. And it certainly doesn't justify us like swinging all the way over and saying because we can't know this, we definitely know this. So you want to keep that in mind. That's those are what we call you know mental habits. Last thing I want to say. This series is part, this video is part of a series that discusses common fallacies in reasoning and argument, and it belongs to a whole channel devoted to trying to, uh, you know, provide people resources, things that they can use to improve their skills in critical thinking, reasoning, argumentation. So if you, if you like this video or you found it useful for yourself, if, if it's helping you develop your skills or understand matters, share it with other people. Come back to the, the channel because we're going to keep uploading more fallacy videos and some other videos that will be very useful for you.